I know quite well that it is always incomplete for any unit operation if we don't have any problem that involves heat and mass transfer so this is it and evaporation is one of those that really employs such kind of heat transfer in the way that it involves a lot of thermodynamics and its principles now let's have this problem as you can see here the difference between the first one and then this one is that you can see right here that we have already introduced a steam which is superheated in this case now let's have some illustration first for this problem okay so this is our evaporator and then let's have all this necessary um, label so we have 120 kilograms per hour of 8 mol aqueous urea solution so let's have this as our heat exchange so we have at the inlet and then it is operating at a pressure of 141 kilopascal so let's have this as the pressure and when we talk about this operating pressure we know that that's actually the pressure of the system so if you would take um, if you would add something like a pressure gauge at the evaporator then you would um, notice that this is the reading of that pressure so that's 141 kilopascal and then 60% of the water present is removed so we know in this problem that if we ha because it's 8 model we know not we know already that there is a fluid in that feed so it will be removed in this case so 60% of that will be removed and then superheated steam is fed at 2.5 now this is the superheated steam and then it goes out of course and then it is fed at 2.5 megapascal 600 kelvin so let me have this as our uh, feed I would also like to emphasize that this 2.5 megapascal and 600 kelvin actually give the state of our steam that's why it is called superheated because the pressure and the temperature are given at the same time when we say saturated the maximum amount of water at that vapor phase is already dissolved in that um, certain condition that's why it is called saturated now if it's superheated then we know that it is heated above its um, normal heating um, temperature so um, we also have something like critical point where in uh, there are cases when the steam is it's super critical but most of the time we're only considering saturated and superheated steam it's just you have to find these two um, values at the Paris handbook and then you'll be able to find its equivalent thermodynamic properties now it goes at, from this equipment and if there is no state no condition present at its um, outlet we will also consider that it goes out at the same temperature and pressure so in this case the steam goes out at the same temperature and pressure but of course uh, this steam is actually going out but now it's already condensed so let's have something like steam which is condensed but um, but taking in consideration our material balance this steam didn't actually get reduced during the process lastly we have the liquor liquor goes out at the bottom so from this section we have actually we the problem didn't specify what is the percentage of our uh, liquor but you can just know it that you can obtain this because we've already given the amount of vapor based on the original water so this is our liquor okay so i think the balance is complete we've already written all the necessary information as well as the illustration now let's go back to the problem we know that the feed is actually 120 kilograms per hour so um, let me just give the feed rate right here so the feed rate is actually equal to 120 um kilograms per hour okay so i think we've already completed all the necessary information so the feed rate is 120 kilograms per hour the temperature is 20 degrees celsius and that's 8 molar urea we have the steam here entering at the gas phase and then it is condensed because we assume that that's the ideal condition of what will happen in this evaporation and then 
the pressure is operating at 141 kilopascal that's the um, system temperature a uh, pressure and then we have the 60% original water removed as the process progresses and then we will also obtain this kind of liquor now to solve this problem first I would like to take in consideration this 8 mol molar urea and I will convert that in terms of mass fraction now to do that we know that 8 molar urea is equal to 8 moles urea and then that's divided by um, 1 kilogram of solvent and in this case it's always water and if it didn't mention in the problem you would always assume that that's what because technically how would you evol I mean how would you vaporize water from this original feed when you don't have water so basically that's our solvent and then we need to convert this in terms of mass fraction and we know very well that if you want to convert this into mass fraction we know that for every 8 molar urea or moles urea we know now we know that there's 60.06 .06 grams of that so that's for every mole and then this is divided by we have 1000 grams of water and then we add 8 times 60.06 .06. so this is how we convert this into mass fraction so we have this as x sub f, x sub f and we could see that the mass fraction is 0 0.0828 okay so it's rounded up to the four decimal places but in this calculation i'll be storing the values at the calculator so that we might get better results in this case so that's 0 0.08277 up to some digits that's our mass fraction and as you can see there it's quite really dilute in the um, feed now if we want to remove the 60% original water, we'll be accounting all these mass balances. And to do that, let's have first our mass balance. By the way, the question is what amount of superheated steam is necessary to deliver the required heat? In this problem, we'll be solving for the required heat. And to do that, we'll be using the energy balance or enthalpy balance, whichever is most applicable. Now, we first solve for the material balance. So for the OMB, we just know that that's the love story of this evaporation. So we have feed is equal to the liquor and then the vapor. So that is 120 kilograms per hour. And then this is equal to the liquor and then the vapor. Now we proceed with the component balance. We know very well that if you would be using the component balance for our component itself, which is the urea, we can see that we can determine the amount of feed rate or exactly the amount of urea inside this feed. But the liquor doesn't specify what amount of concentration is present at this um, condition or at this liquor. So we're left out with just the simple value of the moles of the urea but not the liquor. Now in this case, I'll be using the component balance in terms of water. So the feed rate is 120 kilograms per hour and if we take 1 minus, uh, let's just use the formula. So if we have F and then we take 1 minus XF, so I'm basically referring to water in this case, and then I take the 60% of that, then that will be the vapor. Because it says here that if you take the 60% of the original water present, then you will get the amount of vapor. So I'll be doing that. So 1 minus 0 0.0828, and I'll be using the one stored in the calculator for this calculation, and then that's 0 0.60. Okay, so now we're left with the vapor, 66.0404 kilograms per hour. So that is the amount of our vapor. Now to, to finally get our L, we just subtract this value from 120. So we'll be able to get 53.9596. That's kilograms per hour. Okay, so to give a quick recap, we have a feed of 120. The vapor is escaping at a rate of 66.0404 kilograms per hour. And then the liquor is being obtained at a rate of 53.9596 kilograms per hour. Now, if you'll be asking what could be the amount of liquor in this uh, case, so let's just um, obtain it. We have F, X sub F, which is a component balance. So XL would be equal to the feed, which is 120, times XF, which is 0 0.0828, and then divided by the liquor, which is 53.9596.
so we get xl which is a dimensionless number okay so at the liquor phase or at the liquor the amount of urea is 0.1841 mass fraction so that's 18.41 percent so now we're so much done with the material balance and all its component balance now we go back to the problem and it says here that we need to actually find the amount of the superheated steam and in that way we can also solve that by using energy balance or the enthalpy balance now let's have a quick review of your thermodynamics before we start solving and i don't want to like just give equations and then you don't know where it came from so in remember this in all kinds of unit operations it is always best to use the enthalpy balance instead of energy balance that's always um, a good choice especially when you're when you have the data so um, I'll be doing the enthalpy balance first so that is uh, and I know you already know what enthalpy is but uh, let's just have some quick review so enthalpy is a state function wherein that's the sum of all the internal energy this uh, pressure volume something kind of work and that's always used when we want to find the heat of a certain material wherein you have two states of that um, compound now enthalpy balance of any unit operation can easily be obtained that's simply taking the overall material balance and then incorporating all the necessary enthalpy at that state so what do i mean by that so we start with our um, overall material balance and that is simply this f and then steam is equal to l plus v plus steam so remember these two steams must not be cancelled out because we know very well that if we're involving enthalpy here the states of these um, two steams are different so they're kind of different um, entities right here but if it's just the material then we can cancel them out because they are just the same but if we're talking about enthalpy then they they just retain itself okay something like that so you just have to incorporate all the enthalpies that you need here so if you have f you just have to write hf because that's the enthalpy of that at that certain point of time or at that certain condition then you also add the enthalpy of steam and at this steam we know that this is at its gas phase or vapor phase so let's have a general rule that if we're rep representing any enthalpy which is actually a gas or a vapor we use the capital letter so for gas or vapor we use these capital letters so that we don't get confused oops gas or vapor let's use capital and then for those that are liquid and solids then we use the small one so let's have solids and then liquids and all the equations and in between so we use that as um, small letters is small okay so for this one that's a steam in the gas phase so we use capital H and then that's the steam so this letter here is actually the component that we're looking for so if it says then that's steam if it is feed then that's feed so L is the liquor so we have L and then that's small h and then L plus V that's capital because vapor is in gas phase and then for this S we know that that's a small one because the steam is actually condensed at that um, state okay so that's it for our enthalpy balance that is a very easy problem if since we have the feed we already have the feed we already have the liquor and then the vapor so if you're given with all this enthalpy of the feed enthalpy of the liquor and the enthalpy of this steam at this vapor and condensed state you could just determine right away the value of our s by just substituting the values of this enthalpy but unfortunately there are no available data for such cases for example we want to find the enthalpies of something like orange juices or um, sugar solution you can't actually find them in certain um, chemical engineering books and even in prayers handbook you don't actually find them in certain tables or graphs in the prayers handbook you could be using or utilizing books that are specialized in um, operations wherein you have this certain amount of um, sugar in a certain solution but for us we don't have anything like that so 
that's the sad, that's the bad thing about enthalpy balance. If you don't have any data about it, then you can just use it. Okay. And by the way, I would just like to um redefine this further because if I would be um taking this SHS, I mean this small SHS at the left side and then I'll be transposing the, uh, this FHF at the right so you will be getting this um, value and we know that if this is the enthalpy at the gas phase and this is the enthalpy at the vapor phase we can just factor out this one and then we'll copy this whole term and knowing that this is the vapor and this is the liquid phase and that's the enthalpy at that point we know that at that state we have a constant pressure and a constant temperature so we can just lump this up into s and then that is our latent heat of vaporization this latent heat depends on the two states of the material if you have liquid and gas then that's for va vaporization or condensation then you have for solids and liquid being freezing or melting something like that and of course for gases and solids then you would have sublimation in that case so you take the latent heat of those and by the way we just copy this right side okay so actually this is the final form of our enthalpy balance so let's just um, box this so that you won't forget this expression so whenever you are given with all the enthalpies you can just directly use our enthalpy balance but we don't have anything like that, so let's devise another method for that. And let's do some energy balance in this case. So energy balance is a very common balance in unit operation because it substitutes for enthalpy balance for cases wherein we don't have enough information regarding the problem. In this case also, we don't have enough information. To derive any energy balance in unit operations, we would always incorporate thermodynamics in this case. Let's have enthalpy first. Enthalpy is the sum of energy or the total ener internal energy of the system and then the product of the pressure and then the volume at that certain condition. So that's technically the meaning of enthalpy and basically that's the state function of that certain compound or um, element. So we start with this enthalpy and then let's try to take the total differential of this enthalpy so that we can use the enthalpy at this state. So we know that for every enthalpy we take the total differential we could get du and then we have pdv and then vdp. So in this case in any in any evaporation process we know that we're always at constant pressure and in this case that's 141 kilopascal. So we know that at constant pressure, we know that this expression can be simplified further by canceling this dp because basically we have constant pressure. Okay, so that's left. We're left with pdv and that's du and then pdv. Now we go back with our um, first law of thermodynamics. We know that the energy cannot be created nor destroyed. So they can just be converted into certain um, different forms. Now that's the internal energy and that's the sum of the heat um, at the system and then the work that is done on the system or by the system. It depends upon the situation. So this internal energy can be uh, also, uh, we can also differentiate this as a total differential. So that's dq and then dw. So that's a basic idea of total differential. Now, knowing that this uh, dq it stays the same, that's the heat. And then dw, we know that at constant pressure, we can substitute the value of dq, wherein dq is equal to negative pdv, because that's the expression of, of the work at any constant pressure. So we will use this expression to substitute it here. So we have dh is equal to dq minus pdv and then plus pdv. So this leaves us with the idea that any enthalpy change is equal to the heat change at that um, certain condition at constant pressure so we were we were able to obtain this expression because we know that we're working at a constant pressure so if the pressure is not constant then uh, this just wouldn't work you just have to use enthalpy in this case but in any evaporation we know that we're always considering constant pressure so we can use this one and what does it mean by this and the change in enthalpy is equal to the change in the heat 
we know quite well that um, any change brought about by heat can be expressed in terms of the specific heat capacity because we're considering constant pressure. So that specific heat capacity and then the change in temperature. So that's basically d2 minus d1. And this is basically the change in our enthalpy. So we can relate this at any case in our evaporation. If you go back with any um, enthalpy right here, you can substitute Cp and then the difference in temperature. So we take that as an example. So S, lambda S is equal to L, H sub L plus V, H sub V minus F, H sub F. Okay, and now we can substitute this expression. Now, what is the difference between this uh, small HF to this um, enthalpy? Actually, this H of F is already the difference between these two states. Now, because we don't have any initial condition, we'll be setting a datum temperature. So T sub O is equal to 273.15. Um, if, if you don't know about this datum temperature, this is what we do when we don't have any reference to any condition that is stated in the problem. And in this case, um, the problem didn't specify where it started. It's just that it started with this kind of 20 degrees Celsius. So um, if you would reference something from that certain temperature, we usually do that for our 273.15, that's 0 degrees Celsius. And knowing that we have the same datum temperature, we could just take on this delta T for any um, value of our temperature at any given pressure. So that's TO, and then we'll, we'll represent all of this in terms of CPTO. So we have S and then lambda S, so we don't get any problem. So we don't have any problem with this S lambda S because we know very well that if it's steam, we can always find this at the Paris handbook. So we will be leaving that in that case. So we have the liquor and then we have the specific capacity of the liquor and then T2 minus T1. Now the state of this um, liquor would be the temperature of the liquor minus its datum temperature. We could also add V, H of V right here. And then we won't have to like change this H sub V because that's just one state of the vapor at the point where in, where it is boiling. So and it can also be found at the Paris handbook because that's water. So we'll be leaving that and then minus F. So H sub F would be the specific capacity of the feed and then we have the temperature of the feed minus its datum temperature. So that's fairly simple at this expression but it's a quite long expression. As you can see here, we have a lot of things going on here. We have to find the liquor temperature as well as the specific capacity of each of them. And we know quite well that this liquor actually came from the feed itself. So basically, if that's the case, then we could also specify in this problem that if Cp of the liquid is kind of equal to the specific capacity of the feed, because this is what happens. if Even if you're just having this um, specific heat capacities obtained from a certain value at the um, feed. If the liquor is still dilute at that case, the driving force or the most contribution that you'll be obtaining from specific capacity will come from water itself. So in that case, the specific capacity will just almost be equal. So in this case, let's just um, substitute this expression if they are just equivalent. So we have an LCP of, let's just use the feed, so CP of the feed and then TL minus TO, and then minus F CP of the feed, and then we have TF minus TO, and then plus VHV. Okay, so this is how it goes, and then knowing that for from our material balance, we know that the feed is actually equal to L plus V. So basically, we can substitute the expression in terms of our specific heat, I mean, of our um, vapor taking out this liquor, or we can eliminate liquor taking out our vapor. It depends upon our solution. But in this case, I'll be using something like L is equal to F minus V to substitute this in our expression. So we have S and then lambda S is equal to F minus V and then specific heat capacity of the feed and that is TL minus TO minus F CP of F and then we have TF minus TO and then plus V of HV and then this is equal now to F CP of the feed and then that's TL minus TO 
and then minus F CP of the feed and then that's TF minus TO okay and then we have negative V specific capacity of the feed and then TL minus TO and then plus V H V so now that we have this expression we know quite well that this V CPF and then TL minus TO would give us the value of H sub V why is that so because um, in a vapor chest equilibrium um, we know very well that as the boiling continues that is also the temperature at which the vapor is escaping so it's like um, the, the boiling temperature is also equal to the vapor chest temperature which is obtained from the pressure at the uh, system pressure which is already stated in the problem that's why we can lump this up into F and then this one becomes CPF which is TL minus TF I mean TO minus TF and then plus TO this is um, simplified from this expression then minus V or plus V and then capital HV minus small h sub V which in turn becomes we have S lambda S is equal to F and then CP of F and then TL minus TF because this TO cancels out and then that is equal to our um, vapor and then the latent heat of vaporization at this um, certain condition so we now have our final equation as I mean our final equation as obtained from the enthalpy balance by using all the conditions that um, we have so in this case we have to take note of the assumptions that CPL is equal to CPF we also know that we have no boiling point elevation and on the assumption that TL is equal to TV okay so these are actually the three assumptions that we did but if any of these conditions is not satisfied then we need to take a look uh, back here step back and then you use that general formula if you have it on your um, problem so let's proceed with the computation so we know very well that we need to find this lambda s we need to find the specific capacity of the feed the liquor temperature and as well as this latent heat of vaporization so we start with the ECS let's find this specific capacity of the feed so we know very well that this specific heat capacity of the feed is actually a function of the specific heat capacity of urea itself and then specific heat capacity of water and by doing that we know that we need to ma find the mass fraction of this um, urea and then multiply that with the specific heat capacity of the urea and then we add the one with the specific heat capacity of water and of course its mass fraction so with this we are able to find the specific capacity of our um, feed now we go back with our equation xf is actually equal to um, 0 0.08 and using your Paris handbook you can check on table 2 um, table 2 and then you go to specific capacities of um, certain substances so you have pure compounds here you have aqueous solution so let's uh, check on pure compounds and then we go to organic solids because the urea is supposed to be solid dissolved in that liquid so we have here um, urea at the end that's 20 degrees celsius and then that's 0.320 so we have 0.320 and the unit here is in calories per gram degree celsius so to be able to convert that in joule per gram so we have times 4.184 and then that will be joule and since it's in calorie per gram so we so let me just write the unit so we have calorie per gram kelvin and then we need to convert this into joule per gram so let's just multiply this with 4.184 because one calorie is 4.184 joule okay then we add so 1 minus 0 0.0828 and this is the specific and by the way i would just like to specify that this is the specific capacity of our urea and then for water we go back to thermodynamic properties you already know this and then let's go to this two and then table 2-413 and you will be able to obtain the specific capacity of water at that temperature so the temperature is 
So the temperature is 293.15 Kelvin. So at that point, the specific capacity of water is 4.18 and then 86 uh, that's joule per gram Kelvin so we need to be consistent with the units so therefore the specific capacity of the feed is equal to 3.9527 joule per gram Kelvin okay so this is our specific capacity and you should be taking note that uh, had we used this um, specific capacity of urea alone it will be very um, small and if it's just pure water then it will be quite large so you have to take on the specific capacity of the feed which is uh, based on the fraction of the um, whole I mean the pure components of each of them okay now that we already have the specific capacity of urea now let's try finding the rest of the knowns so let's uh, have this first this TL now um, to give you a background about this TL let's have to find TL so T sub L is actually the liquor temperature. So when we say liquor temperature, this is the point at which the solution boils, actually. So if it is boiling, we know very well that this is a function of the pressure or the system pressure itself. So for example, if the evaporator operates at a certain pressure, then the saturation temperature at that condition should be the liquor temperature at which this solution should be boiling. So in this case, we know very well that T sub L is equal to T sub V. That's, um, that's always an assumption when we don't have any boiling point elevation. And to be able to find TV, let's go back with our system pressure. And our system pressure is equal to 141 kilopascal. Because it says here that it's 141 kilopascal. So um, we go back to the thermodynamic properties right here. And then we interpolate at that value for our TL. So you should be taking this as 0 0.141 kilopascal. So that's basically um, around here. This is the value. I mean the pressure at that point. So the equivalent temperature at that is around 380 and then 390. So interpolating for that, we can obtain a value of TV. So that is equal to 382.2. 3922 Kelvin so that is also equal to our TL okay so we already have this TL now we're left with our lambda here for S and then for V now um, we take first this lambda V for the vapor so if we have this kind of vapor we already know that we need to evaluate the enthalpies at the vapor and the liquid phase for this um, pressure so for this case, we have lambda, I mean, let's have capital H, V, and then small v, so that this difference would give us lambda v, okay? So we need to find these two first. So at 141 kilopascal or at 382.392 Kelvin, we can evaluate for those values. So uh, you'll be using your Paris handbook again and then check, take a look at this. So for our liquid phase, I'll be starting with this. So for the liquid phase, phase and you should be expecting a smaller value for the liquid phase so we have now for the liquid phase that's 8.2550 and the unit is in kilojoule per mole now you can convert this in terms of joule per gram so I'll be converting it so we will be able to get 458 point um, Wait, 458.6112 um, joule per gram. Now this should be in, um, this should be for the liquid phase. So I'll be moving this. So this one should be the for the liquid phase. Okay. And now we proceed with computing for the enthalpy at the vapor phase. So you will be able to get 48.4581. That's kilojoule per mole. So that is equal to 2692.1149. So you should be expecting a higher value for your gas phase because the enthalpy or the internal energy that are actually 
uh, involved in this situation would be a lot larger because we already know that internal energy is quite dependent on the um, the forces inside of the um, component of the um, compound or the element itself. But and since since it is um, gas gaseous, the movement of that and then the energy created and that um, condition or state would be a lot larger. So we have higher value for this and then if we subtract them, we can take the latent heat of vaporization for this um, particular equation. So we have 458, I mean, we have 2233. So we have 2233.5037. So we'll be using this as our lambda V obtained from the pressure at the system. So this is to find TL and lambda V. Okay, so these are all obtained from the fact that we have the pressure at the system that's 141 kilopascal. Okay, so we have CPF. Let's have here to find CPF. We have CPF, we have uh, the degree temperature, and now we proceed with finding the last of them, which is the delta, I mean lambda S. Now to find this lambda S, we'll be employing the same principles as this uh, first computation. And we know very well that lambda S is the difference of our enthalpy at the vapor of the steam and then the enthalpy at uh, li the liquid phase of this steam. So we'll be able to get lambda S because that's um, a condensed steam at this um, portion. Because this is how we assume the problem. The steam enters at this um, condition and then it is um, condensed at uh, the same condition hoping that it is actually condensed at that um, certain condition now if you would look at the Paris handbook you can see here that this is the saturated properties and we know for sure that the given is superheated so it's no longer saturated so we move further than this and then we can see right here that we have the single phase properties and we will be evaluating at this pressure so as you can see here, we have 0.11 and then 5. So we don't have any 2.5 megapascal, but we do have 1 and 5. And then the temperature there is 600. And we know very well that there's actually 600 right here, and we're lucky because of that. And at this point, we only have 1 megapascal. But if we would look here, we could see that at this um, 1 megapascal, we have 56.009. So we can write that down first. So we have for 1 megapascal, we have 56. 0 0.009 and then if we take on the value of 5 megapascal at the same temperature which is 600 okay so this is 600 as well that is the saturated properties for our um, vapor phase so that's 54.151 so we have 54.5151 okay so we will be interpolating in between these two values so that we get 2.5 megapascal and then the value for this in enthalpy Okay, so we'll be having 55.31225 in this case, and that is equivalent to 3072.9028, that's Joule per gram, okay? So as you can see here, H sub S is 3072.9028 Joule per gram from our condition that is 600 Kelvin and then 2.5 megapascal, and that is super and my handwriting is super messy. Actually, it's quite it's kind of difficult to write um, using this tablet. Okay, but anyway, we proceed. So we move on with finding our H sub S at the vapor or at the liquid phase. So um, if we would look at the liquid phase, this is right here. This is the liquid phase for one megapascal, and this is the liquid phase for our five. So um, you might be noticing that we don't have any six hundred at this phase. Uh, as well as for 500 we don't have any 600 kelvin for this phase because that's just 300 to 537.9 and um, since paris handbook doesn't have any phase diagram we can't use that because if it if it has then it could have been easier for us to solve for i mean uh we would have an idea of how this steam works and it, it could if it could really be condensed after the process Okay, so in this case, if we just look at the table, we know very well that at 1 megapascal, 453.03, it is still a liquid. But as it increases from this uh, point, 
we could see very well that at 500 it changed into its gas phase so we might as know very well in this case that we don't have any liquid property that is at 600 kelvin and 2.5 megapascal because if you would look at this 5 megapascal we could see it right from this um, portion that the liquid only exists at a maximum of 537.09 kelvin and we do have 600 so basically 600 is right here it exists as if it's a pure vapor so with that knowing that it doesn't exist at a condition where it is liquid at, at 600 and then 2.5 then we know that h sub s is equal to zero therefore lambda s is simply equal to h sub s and that is equal to 3072.9028 so we actually got a wrong assumption in our problem it's right here because in this problem we assume that the steam will be condensed but either way uh, it didn't it won't give you the incorrect answer because you just um, added a sub s equal to zero right here so it's just a wrong assumption that the steam will be condensed the fact still remains that the steam will not be condensed at this um, operation because that's superheated meaning it really has a lot of internal energy and enthalpy on that um, condition for the steam so anyway we proceed with the computation so we have s and then lambda s let's use another color so we have s lambda s and then this is equal to we have f cp of the feed and then we have the temperature of the liquor minus t f and then plus v and then lambda v then we have we still have to find s and then this lambda s is our h sub s so we get 3072.9028 joule per gram and then this is equal to our feed so our feed is i think 120 so that's 120 and then the specific capacity of the feed is obtained from the fraction so 3.9527 so we have 3.9527 and then that is um, joule per gram kelvin and then we have tl minus to so tl is our tv obtained from the system pressure so that's 382.3922 so 382.3922 and then minus that's our feed temperature so that will be 293 um let's move this so that you have enough space okay so we have minus 293.15 and that is in kelvin because that's 20 degrees and then plus we have the vapor so the vapor is obtained a while ago we have 66.0404 that's kilogram per hour and then we have this um, lambda v which is actual shot which is actually equal to 2233.5037 and that's in joule per gram okay so now we can cancel things out here we have cancel k and then this this joule per gram when divided by joule per gram we can cancel them all out and then we will be left out with this um, kilogram per hour unit so I forgot to write kilogram per hour here. Okay, so S is equal to. So we have S as sixty one point seven seven five eight, and that is in kilogram per hour. So this is our final answer because the problem asks for the amount of steam that is needed to, uh, for this operation to deliver the required heat. Now, why is it so that? Um, we determined S from this expression knowing that it's actually the heat that is being asked because um, S lambda S is actually equal to Q itself this is our one of the general expression for our um, for our problem here um, I don't know if I mentioned about it but we know very well that if the steam is being used as a heating medium so the steam will be having its enthalpy and then the changes that might occur at the moment it enters and leaves the evaporator so whatever the change it can happen at the state at the two states of that steam so that should be typically the heat that is being absorbed by the uh, the solution itself so this absorption of heat would um, increase the final temperature as well as vaporize the remaining liquid or some of the liquid so basically if you just take the difference in between these two states of the steam and then multiply that with the amount of steam then you'll be able to get q now for the design equation um, you could also know 
that Q is equal to U, A, and then delta T. This is also true for evaporators. In evaporators, if you have the overall heat transfer coefficient, the surface heating area, and then this delta T, which is usually the difference between the temperature of the steam and then the temperature of the vapor, so it is usually this um, difference, it will give you the value of your Q. So basically that's it for the design equation and if we've got problems like this then I'll show you how it is done and if you don't, for example, we don't have any something like uh, mass material balance and then you're given with just this UA and then delta T so you can actually find Q right there and then you can also find S if you're given with the amount, I mean the, temp the pressure and temperature condition of the steam. Now, um, I would also like to emphasize about the superheated steam because um, in this problem, we use superheated steam instead of saturated steam. We know very well that if it's saturated, for sure the steam would be condensed after the process. So in this case, this H sub S would not be equal to zero and therefore we do have something like lambda S right here. And because it's superheated, we know very well that the condition, if the condition remains constant, it doesn't get any... Um, amount of liquid that is being condensed so uh, the face of that steam would still remain as a vapor and it typically has a lot of um, steam that is inside I mean this steam is carrying a lot of like energy on it that's why uh, even though you were able to um, kind of um, increase the temperature at the v evaporator this steam didn't even like flinch Okay, this steam still has the, the huge amount of energy that it doesn't even get condensed during the process. Anyway, so um, let me talk about this steam economy first. So steam economy is one way of determining how your um, evaporator is, how good your evaporator is. And this is typically equal to the, the ratio of the vapor and then the steam. Now, if you would take the steam economy for this problem, you could see here that we have the vapor that is equal to 66.04 um, and then for the steam, we get 61.7758. Now, uh, upon solving this, you would get uh, a value that is greater than 1. Now, I would also like to emphasize that this problem is a very hypothetical problem and they should not be um, emulated okay so because uh, you should remember that steam economy shouldn't be greater than one so basically this problem I mean this condition won't be possible because in the first place the steam is not being condensed in this particular um, scenario so if the steam doesn't get condensed then or even if it, it, we don't have any H sub S value so the small one the liquor we know very well that we could just reuse this steam if that's the case because um, technically it doesn't get um, the energy is so sufficient to be able to drive that particular um, change in the temperature at the evaporator that's why our steam economy became greater than one now i would also like to say that um, this is a very hypothetical problem again and this is quite impossible for us to happen because steam economy should always be less than one so um, probably this problem should have uh, given us something like um, a lower value of the pressure of the steam because technically taking 2.5 megapascal and 600 kelvin at the initial inlet of that steam is actually a very it would it will require you a very um, highly advanced machine to be able to do that and then feed that on the evaporator so it will really drive uh, uh, the evaporation into completion but um, as you can see here, it's quite impossible to do that because of the steam economy that is greater than one. So uh, I think that the, the condition was actually a re a really extreme at this point. That's why the steam economy became less uh, greater than one. But of course, in problems that you will be able to solve in, for example, use your gene couplings or MacCabe, you will realize that this steam economy is always less than one, especially if it's single effect. Okay, so then don't get confused with that. So maybe I'll be um, adjusting this on a future discussions, like um, just using, let's say, 1 megapascal, 600 Kelvin, so that we can get H sub S at a lower value. Okay, so that's it for this um, discussion.